you know, you're, you're now an investor that's pretty active in investing. But I want to first go back to the early days of when you, you know, when you were an entrepreneur. You know, you founded a company called Iron Planet back in 99. And then I want to hear kind of how that experience as an entrepreneur kind of shaped you as an investor. Yeah, um, actually, it was, there, were, there were a couple of companies. So I, you know, growing up, that's all I wanted to do was to be an entrepreneur. I wasn't really sure why, but I think it was because I liked the idea of, you know, being your own boss and, and, and building something, you know, that wasn't, wouldn't exist otherwise. And um, that was what I wanted to do as a kid. And so I wanted to go to Stanford. I grew up in Chicago. And um, for the Latin Americans out there, it's in the middle of the country. And uh, I always wanted to go to Stanford because at that time, it seemed like this magical place, and this is in the late 80s, um, to, uh, you know, build a technology company. I didn't know what it was or what it would be, but that's what I wanted to do. And eventually that worked out, you know, um, after sort of business school. So it, what really happened was um, in between years of business school, in between my first and second year at Stanford Business School, I... Um, I, I was just in school, the sole intent of finding a co-founder to start some kind of company with. And, you know, I didn't really find one. So I was going to take a summer job with something called um, Los Alamos National Labs. Americans know what that is. It's famous for it's where they developed the, the first nuclear bomb, really. I mean, um, and, you know, these national labs have all these great technologies that they've developed for other things that they think have other uses. And, and the idea was, you know, for my, my summer job was supposed to be to go there and visit, spend time with all the scientists and, and see what their technologies are and see if any of those could be commercialized and turned into a company. And this is 1998. And I thought that was just the best job in the world because it was like being a kid in a candy store and see all these technologies. Can any of these, you know, be a business? And I was pretty naive at the time not knowing how hard it is to turn just a raw technology into a business. But I figured, look, I'd, I'd spend six weeks doing that. And if it didn't work, you know, I didn't find anything interesting. I'd just mountain bike the rest of the time because Los Alamos is in a very beautiful area in the mountains of New Mexico. And um, two weeks before I was supposed to start that job, I essentially got a call from some people at Kleiner Perkins, which was a sort of well-known venture capital firm at the time in Silicon Valley. Uh, to see if I wanted to work with this guy, Vinod Kosla, to be his sort of, I don't know, intern. Because he supposedly had a business idea that he wanted to start and he needed somebody to do some research and write a business plan. And, and um, I felt like I couldn't turn that down. So I did that instead of the, the other job. And the only reason I got that offer, by the way, it's a funny story, was because back at the time, it's, you know, this is the late 90s, the internet really started in kind of 93, 94, in terms of being a commercial entity, right? The first companies. So 98, it was still pretty new. And there was very few people in business school who had any experience with internet companies or, you know, at the time, because they were so new. And usually you'd only work for two years before business school and everyone's kind of 26. So it was really hard. So I was one of two people in my business school class about 307 people who had any experience because my I, I had a, about a six-month job before business school started I worked at Bain and then I took as soon as I got into business school I said I'm not learning anything more here let's go do something more interesting and I spent six months at a company called Zip2 which was Elon Musk's first company actually wow. and so he was uh, he was like my age exactly we were both I don't know 23 24 this is 1996 97 and um, he was the CTO and founder. He wasn't the CEO, actually. There was a professional CEO who had been brought in. And what Zip2 did is it made um, products. Right now, we would call it a SaaS company, but that didn't exist back then. But it was a company that worked with newspapers and made products to help them do online versions of their newspapers, which was very new at the time. And they were all getting their lunch eaten by people like eBay and others who were stealing their advertising revenue streams and they wanted to be competitive. So they needed their own version of a classified service, their own version of an arts and entertainment guide of an auto guide. And so we created all those things at Zip2 and then the newspapers would, and we private labeled them to newspapers. So the, you know, the San Jose Mercury News or the Los Angeles Times, their car guide was the one provided by Zip2 or their arts and entertainment guide. And then we had like a yellow pages and maps and directions. And so I was a, like a junior product manager 
working with them and, and Elon and I used to get in these fights because you know he always wanted to do these really expensive things you know and we were supposed to work with the newspapers and the newspapers would sell the ads and they would you know they were supposed we were supposed we were just going to build the technology and they would kind of generate the revenue and we would share in it um it became really clear that the newspapers were really bad at selling online ads so elon just wanted to build this gigantic call center and this gigantic you know thing for for zip2 to do this and you know we didn't have the money and it wasn't part of our business model so i kept trying to argue that this wouldn't work and we just need to be better at working the newspapers. And, um, you know, so I found him at the time to be this sort of young, stubborn, ridiculously smart guy. Um, meanwhile, if the, you know, if the site ever had a problem or there was a, a technological roadblock that no one on the engineering team could fix, you know, they'd argue about it on Friday and then we'd come in on Monday and it would be completely fixed and solved and there'd be a sleeping bag and a pillow underneath Elon's desk. He just spent all weekend sleeping under his desk until he fixed it himself, right? right. All, he was always like this. And um, so it was a great education for me being a former consultant, seeing how a startup really worked where the, the real value wasn't getting the right answer. The real value was getting shit done. And that was a big mental change for me. So like with Elon, and he saw that from the beginning, he's like, look, we can't rely on these fucking newspapers and it might be a more elegant business model, but we need to, we need to do this ourselves and do it right. And so even though it's going to cost us a lot of money, he, he knew he could, you know, and he was ultimately right that we do it faster. So, you know, then I went to business school and, um, and so I was one of two people in my class of 300 and whatever, 70 people who had any experience at an internet company. You know, Elon Musk was not famous at the time, nor was Zip2, it was kind of this middling little startup. But, you know, of one of two, you know, that's how I got the job at Clarner Perkins because they needed somebody who had some experience. And um, that was it. And um, so I worked with Vinod and, and it became very apparent that, you know, this idea of the business he had or that the research he had supposedly done was one sentence on a whiteboard. And, and I was like, well, I was told this was all ready to go. And he's like, no, you know, whatever. So, so I just immediately left the offices and began kind of taking the one sentence and then meeting a bunch of people and, inter you know, potential customer interviews and potential employees and, wound up writing a business plan and turning it into a company by the end of the summer. Um, and like, for instance, the, the VP of marketing was my landlord who had been a VP of solutions marketing at Oracle. I had him, the head of operations was somebody who worked at zip two that I knew that we hired to be the head of operations. The head of engineering was the older brother of one of my business school classmates. So I just sort of assembled this ragtag team to put this thing together and became something called Corio that was the first, what was called an application service provider back then. Now we call it a SaaS, it was sort of version 0 0.1, not even 1.0 of a SaaS company. And the idea was to take existing enterprise applications and host them in what we would call now the cloud. But back then it was just sort of a data center. And um, it eventually went public and IBM bought it, but I went back and finished school and, you know, you know um, and it was a great experience, like this, this like figuring out how to get something done. And Kleiner Perkins was like, this is fantastic. Normally we hire these interns and they all spend their time like kissing our ass and trying to figure out how to get a permanent job with us and become a venture capitalist. And, you know, they're always here wanting to go to all meetings. And we didn't even see you. Like you left and then you came back with the company. Like, that's what we want. So now we want you to work for us and be a venture capitalist. And I said, no, that's the point. I don't want to, I want to be an entrepreneur. I don't want to work for you. I, I think being a venture capitalist sounds it looks really boring and, and I don't know, I want to do stuff, right? I, I mean, I got the taste of, for being in these startups, doing things was so powerful. And so I came back as what's called an entrepreneur. And they said, well, fine, you, won't, you don't want to work for us, come back and be an EIR, an entrepreneur in residence. And whatever you want to start, we'll fund you. I mean, that was sort of the, the message. And, um, and, and, and then I met this, this gentleman named Reza Bundy, who um, really had the initial idea for something called that became Iron Planet. He didn't really have any experience building or executing anything. So I sort of, you know, partnered with him and, and then we built this thing, Iron Planet, um, that eventually, you know, more senior experienced CEOs came in and ran and did a great job. And then, um, you know, it was, it's a marketplace for construction equipment and trucks and things like that. And then um, it was bought by a public company called Ritchie Brothers that does something similar um, it, it, for about 700 million bucks. but 
It was bought like four years ago. So it took a long time. I only stayed with it for the first few years. Um, but, you know, I love that. And then it was time to be a, you know, a venture capitalist, not because I wanted to, but because it was 2001. And that was a, for those people listening, most of them are probably too young to remember, but 2001 was a very difficult time in the technology business. It was sort of the dot-com bust. And you literally couldn't get a U-Haul in San Francisco because everyone was moving out. Um, all the headlines of the newspapers were, you know, venture capital is dead, Silicon Valley is dead. You, you know, there's, the venture model is completely broken, you know, and, um, and my wife was pregnant and, you know, we had sort of brought in a real senior CEO at, at, at Iron Planet. So, and that's when Axel, who was an investor in Iron Planet, approached me and said, hey, you'd be really good at this investing thing. Why don't you come do it? Um, and I wasn't sure whether I believed them or thought it was the right time to do it. Um, but I think I felt like I had no choice because my wife saw how much they were willing to pay me and said, you're not going to do this. Um, we had no health insurance. I mean, so so I took it. And that was in 2000. I formally started in 2003 and been there more or less ever since.